Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for, for joining today's seminar. Uh, my name is Douglas Arner, and I'm a professor uh, here at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, and this seminar uh, is hosted by Hong Kong U's uh, East Asian International Economic Law and Policy Program of our Asian Institute of International Financial Law, uh, the Hong Kong U Standard Chartered uh, Foundation FinTech Academy, and the Asia Global Institute. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Jochen Biederman. Uh, Dr. Biederman is the Managing Director of the World Association of International Financial Centers, uh, as well as Managing Partner of FinTech Consult and Founder and CEO of Blockchain Asia. Um, Jochen uh, actually has a PhD in mathematics and has worked uh, for a long time uh, in the financial services sector in major financial institutions as well as in a range uh, of policy organizations uh, dealing with international finance. Um, I've had the pleasure uh, of working with Jochen over the past several years in the context of a number uh, of WAIFC events, and it's a great pleasure to have him visiting uh, here in person. And of course, this is actually, I think, one of the first events with an actual foreign visitor that we've hosted here uh, at the Hong Kong U Faculty of Law in a rather long period of time. Uh, and today, we're running this as a hybrid event and very nice to have a physical audience in front of us uh, and also uh, to be joined by all of those of you uh, coming in from online. Jochen today is going to be talking about one of my favorite topics, the future of financial centers. Uh, and here at Hong Kong U, this is a topic where uh, we've had a team working for a very uh, extended period of time. And I think uh, this period as we come out of COVID, both in the region and globally, is a particularly interesting time uh, to look at this issue. And I will say uh, from the standpoint of those of you in the room, uh, we have had a few uh, relaxations in COVID rules recently, and that means that for events such as this, the speaker, so long as none of us are within two meters, uh, doesn't actually have to wear a mask, uh, which is um, rather uh, a major development. So with that, Joachim, the floor is yours, and thank you. Douglas, thank you very much for your kind introduction and for having me. Uh, let me take the uh, exact two meter distance to you so that we also uh, you know, stay in line the, the Hong Kong regulation. But I can only encourage any international visitors to come to Hong Kong. I think Hong Kong is definitely open again and the new zero plus C policy is, is not an issue at all. Everything works very professional here. So, so much, so much for the Hong Kong government, my promotion part, and uh, let's uh, look uh, at the future of financial centers. Um, first, allow me uh, to briefly, to introduce the World Alliance of International Financial Centers, our association, briefly. You see here some of our members. Um, we currently represent 28 financial centers across uh, five continents. So. Uh, but uh, before I go into further details, just a little bit of an overview of uh, what is in front of us. I'll show a little, I will show a few pictures, give a little bit of news what we are doing. This is probably the relaxing part for you. Also, we'll talk a little bit about our, our projects, our work, and then come to the role of financial centers. Uh, look a little bit at the Young Academic Award. Uh, Douglas knows this. We have an annual award competition, and I want to encourage you to maybe consider uh, participating in it. We'll talk about the future of finance. And my final slide, don't be worried about the 63, my final slide will be about Hong Kong financial centers. Um, I thought maybe it would be nice to do some kind of SWOT analysis and look a little bit at the strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats from maybe from an international point of view. This, you might have different opinions, uh, but this is probably something which hopefully will all, in, also encourage you to ask some questions or maybe disagree with me on, on some of the observations. 
But without further ado, let's uh, look into what we are doing. Here again on a world map, our, our membership, um, you see it's, it's quite uh, focused on, on Europe with, uh, on the other hand, with Asian members, African members, and a little bit in North America. We are still wo working on South America and Australia. And our mission is to organize a collaboration between financial centers. Um, I will come to the term financial centers a little bit later. Uh, so what I, what I mean exactly when I talk about financial centers, uh, keep that question in mind if you have it. Um, financial centers, in a way, are in competition with each, with each other, not everywhere, but you could rightly say here in this part of the world, maybe Hong Kong versus Singapore, in a, to a lesser extent versus Shanghai or Tokyo. Um, in Europe, there is also a lot of competition. Of course, London and New York compete with each other on, on global business, but there's so much more where the financial centers need to cooperate, work together. Um, think about the financial centers serving uh, corporates, corporates with international business in many countries, and unlike banks, if they serve corporates, they can just set up a branch office in a different country or a subsidiary. Financial centers, they cannot move to a different country. By definition, they're in, in one place, be it London or here in, in Hong Kong. And uh, so they need to find other ways uh, to, to follow where they're needed. And this only works with, by cooperating on sustainability standards, on connecting fintech ecosystem, and so much more. So this is what we are doing in our association. Um, just a few numbers. Um, our members' countries, because of course financial centers, they back their uh, local economies, count for 43 trillion US dollars uh, GDP, um, or maybe 20,000 fintech companies, 60,000 investment firms, 8,000 banks, and you see a sizable capital market impact of 55 trillion uh, US dollar uh, total value of stocks traded, and so on and so forth. I could add many more numbers, so it's quite sizable. A few pictures, as promised. We just uh, met in October in Casablanca in Morocco, and I learned, Douglas, you also were, were there in Morocco uh, during that time, and had our annual general meeting, but also welcomed three new members, uh, Jersey Finance, uh, uh, close to uh, close to France, uh, part of the uh, uh, UK uh, international territories, and finance Malta, also plays with a long-standing British tradition, um, as our latest, uh, most recent members. Uh, but we also elected a, a new chair and vice chair, and, and so on and so forth. I'll I'll spare you that part. We also met uh, the Minister of Investment in Morocco. Morocco now is uh, highly interesting, in particular for European countries, for investment into solar, into green hydrogen. Um, so, and they're building up the infrastructure for this. If you have ever seen pictures of Dubai, which over the last 20 years built up a sizable financial centers, many high rises, lots of business and so on, you know, Casablanca is following a similar path. Um, every time I go there, the number of high-rises doubles. They also have a territory for the financial center. And uh, yeah, it remembers me not only uh, what happened in Dubai, but also what happened in Pudong, in, in Shanghai, uh, where I was, a, I, my, my first visit must, must have been 2000, in the year 2000, and there were just two high-rises at that time, and then every trip, uh, they're not doubled, but tripled. Um, we also uh, went to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, this year in March uh, to Kigali, Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda, uh, it's a small country, often overlooked, roughly 10 million inhabitants, but very stable, a uh, lot of promising business, still quite poor. GDP per capita is around 2,000 US dollar but also uh, with uh, aspiring financial industry, many fintechs. Uh, so I think it's quite interesting place. Next to Morocco is a second bet uh, I, I would take for you know, prospering and future African financial centers. 
and uh, we were even invited by the president of Rwanda, uh, a man very, very much uh, backing, you know, the developments of Rwanda in general, but also of, you know, the financial center activities. It was very inspiring to listen to him. Before we went uh, to Tokyo, um, fin fin City Tokyo's uh, global forum, um, like uh, Hong Kong, Fin City, the metropolitan government or the central government, they are very much uh, backing the developments uh, there. In particular, Governor Koike of uh, the metropolitan region of, of Tokyo uh, is very much behind. And uh, they're also, I've seen, they're also more often coming to Hong Kong uh, and are interested in connecting asset management in particular. So, yeah, it's also a little bit of competition. On the other hand, uh, the focus is so different. Hong Kong as an international financial center and a, and a, and a bridge to the mainland. Um, Tokyo more with a domestic focus, but slowly also opening up for, for international business. Yeah, so much uh, to the picture part. What we are, what we are doing. Um, first of all, uh, fintech is very important for us. We encourage, encourage closer cooperation between our members, so connecting the fintech ecosystem, and we also regularly discussing best practices in, in financial technology. You see some of the topics. I think it goes without saying, things like open banking, central bank uh, digital currencies, blockchain and digital assets. Um, all these kind of things, artificial intelligence and finance, and Douglas, you, you joined one of our webinars as a speaker. Many thanks for this. And uh, most recently also we uh, looked into metaverse and finance, or Web3, uh, this interesting application on one hand in, in terms of embedded finance, but on the other hand also giving new means maybe of stuff education, training, and, and so on. So uh, I uh, I did with some students, in uh, MBA students in Frankfurt, uh, uh, a small analysis survey and so on. And uh, in at least the German business and the financial industry things is still two to five years ahead of us. Um, still early days for the metaverse. But as we know, things sometimes happen faster than we expect. Um, SME financing, so financing of small and medium-sized enterprises, uh, is also an important topic. Traditionally, there's bank finance, uh, to a lesser extent, capital market finance, or you know, only plays, plays an important role in some countries like US, UK, and so on. But there are so more new platforms, in many cases run by fintech companies, clever ways of uh, financing SMEs, um, whether it's inventory finance uh, or uh, financing of uh, supply chains. Um, or uh, uh, other, other ways. So I think this is something where we also exchange best practices. Let me skip that. Um, we definitely look at sustainable finance, and I will come to this a little bit later. Um, while currently there's so much focus on climate finance, probably the most pressing issue uh, in sustainable finance, um, we also encourage um, that we don't overlook you know, all the other also crucial topics, maybe slightly less urgent. Biodiversity is, is one of the issues, and the other one, from my point of view, is a circular economy, which requires financing. And this is definitely something like uh, for climate finance where the governments cannot finance each and everything. You know, whole production processes of, of corporates need to, need to be modified, need, need to update it, may, maybe new machinery, and, and so on. So, and this here includes uh, definitely also suppliers. So the circular economy is something we, we have in mind. Fortunately, some people were already working on this, uh, but it's still small and from my point of view has to grow quickly. Inclusive finance, another topic. Um, in greater China, uh, of course there are enormous important success stories uh, in, in terms of financial inclusion. Look at Ant and uh, also Tencent, what, uh, what they did in rural areas in, in the mainland, bringing people into financial services which had no ex access to finan financial services at all. I think there was one project, if I remember by Ant, 100,000 villages, uh, something like this, 
where they also installed internet, mobile internet, and, and so on and so forth. Um, unfortunately, uh, there's not much about those stories uh, in, in the international media, so this is uh, something I encourage, uh, you know, the friends in the mainland who tell a little bit more what's, what's happening in that uh, aspect, because always lots of critis criticism on what's happening in China, but they also need to tell more their success stories. Uh, we take those showcases, um, we explain to each other, you know, all the activities, also financial education, even, you know, in early, in, in early days in schools and, and so on. So there are quite attractive programs on this. Um, so to improve the financial literacy, so this is what we are uh, doing here. But also uh, we're discussing, you know, what, you know, um, hinders, for instance, global trade. We see more and more cases uh, between developed markets and emerging markets where, um, you know, uh, exaggerate, let me put it that way, maybe the regulators will not like what I say, let's say exaggerated anti-money laundering and anti-terrorist financing rules um, stops banks uh, serving international trade. Uh, we know cases and we looked at cases where in, in developed markets in Europe, uh, banks threaten uh, to close corporate accounts of, uh, of business just because of trading activity with some African countries or even United Arab Emirates uh, because checking then those individual transactions, those money coming in and then have to do checks and this is a lot of manual efforts. Um, uh, know your business doesn't work so seamlessly across countries, you know, maybe they have to phone up someone or inquire information. And then this is at the end very costly for the banks and maybe they don't make enough money with that particular corporate client if it's an SME and then just tell them go somewhere else, right? So um, I think the, that business in Europe maybe can handle it, right? So they lose a little bit of revenues. But for their trading partners, let's say in an African country, this can be a big issue, right? So they're excluded also from uh, potential business, even if they have a superior product as an at, at an attractive price. Um, the, the newest uh, project we are just starting is supply chain finance, um, where currently many business are in the middle of uh, a lot of uh, transformational changes. On one hand, there's an increased demand for ESG disclosure. Uh, I'll come to the topic of ESG a little bit later. Uh, ESG, as maybe many of you know, stands for um, uh, Environment, Social and Corporate Governance. On the other hand, we have uh, geopolitical influence on, on supply chains. Um, there's an, uh, now quite intensive competition over uh, strategic goods you know, rare earths and, and, and so on, and that kind of stuff. And also, you know, incre increasing uh, uh, responsibilities of, of compliance. So, and yeah, and then the, the corporates have to diversify their supply chains and, and so on and so forth. And of course, this also requires financing. And last but not least, we want to have those processes more digital, right? So the digital transformation also comes in. A little bit about uh, financial centers, the role of financial centers and the future of financial centers. Let me start by uh, claiming or maybe even stipulating that in 2030 financial centers will be green, smart, innovative, customer-centric and inclusive. So this is a little bit the, the vision uh, of all our members and uh, we had a lot of discussion on this last year, roundtables, and in, in June this year, we published uh, jointly with our member, the Dubai International Financial Center and Zed Yen Group. Zed Yen Group, maybe some of you might heard of them. They always publish the financial center ranking, so two times a year. Um, this white paper, you can download it from our website. Um, it, not only looks into the future, but also uh, shows a little bit the historical development of financial centers coming from a few hundred years ago, and also the different kinds of financial centers. You know, we have traditional centers, as I said, developed over, over centuries, but you also have some sort of, let me call it, greenfield financial centers, you know, 
they started by a government decision to build up a financial center. So I think it's maybe an, uh, hopefully interesting lec uh, uh, lecture or literature or showing a little bit those kind of developments. Let me skip that page and come to the next one. Um, I've promised to talk a little bit about financial centers. When I speak about financial centers, what I mean is this physical industry cluster, like other industries have. So um, cluster means all the actors in the broadest sense meet at one place. Um, in the financial industry, this could be investors, could be guarantors, could be traders or other risk bearers or in terms of, you know, the, the function could be banks, could be insurance uh, companies, could be asset managers, fintechs, and, and so on and so forth. But also universities, of course, because all those players need talent. Um, uh, and then, of course, all the uh, other services supporting them, tax advisors, advisors, lawyers, accountants, and, and so on and so forth. And they all tend to, uh, stay in one place to interact with each other. Um, at least this was uh, before the pandemic. Now, of course, we have a slightly changing landscape with more remote work and so on. And some people already thought about in the future, we will still need these physical clusters. Maybe we'll have virtual financial centers who follow a certain vision, but don't need to be in proximity and, uh, anymore. So this is an open question. We will see this in the future. Um, but so far, what we see uh, in terms of financial centers, uh, of course, they have a, have a strong impact. Usually, they lead to a higher GDP of the, of the countries they're in, increased investments, tax revenues, of course. Uh, usually, they also create new jobs. Not always. Sometimes they're layoffs, but uh, on a net basis, uh, they uh, have an important impact on the job market, uh, to help to develop the professional sectors, but they're also in indirect benefits. So uh, by financial market development, they have an impact on the business environment, institution, and so on. And last but not least, and Hong Kong is the best place to see this, they have an impact on urban development, right? So, um, so from, from that point of view, uh, financial centers, in a way, what do we expect? A lot of high rises in, in a city center, and Hong Kong is one case, but of course, if, if you look at London or New York or Tokyo, you, are, you see similar patterns. And uh, also, of course, they form a community, right? So, um, as I said, it's a way a competition, but also a, a competition between financial centers. So, these are, you know, the, the key things uh, we will see. Um, sustainability, a very important topic uh, for all the financial centers. Really, all our members care a lot about this. And uh, the financial centers usually can play several important roles. Two of them are they can, can broker on one hand between government regulators uh, and the financial industry because usually they have the financial center organization, they have the trust of both sides. So while maybe governments and regulators not always trust if a banking association says, ah, oh, you should do this and you should do that, uh, financial centers organization are more balanced. Uh, by the way, I have mentioned this, uh, our member in Hong Kong is a Financial Services Development Council. Um, this is a council which is not exactly legally part of the Hong Kong government, but advising the Hong Kong government uh, comprise uh, secretaries, like the Secretary of Financial Service in the Treasury, uh, but also CEOs of, of leading banks uh, here, Hong Kong exchanges, and, and so on and so forth, lawyers. Um, so, and uh, our other members have, have similar organizations. Uh, sometimes it's really part of the government. It's a government agency promoting the financial centers, but we also uh, regularly in Europe see public-private partnerships. So this is when I talk about financial center organizations. So as I said, on one hand, they can broker a little bit the different interests between government and the financial industry. But on the same way, they also need to go in between the financial industry and corporates. And in particular, SMEs, you know, at, you know if you talk about sustainable finance and ESG, you know, the, the corporates need to understand what the financial industry is expecting from them. Um, 
banks can do that job, uh, but uh, in many cases more is, is, is needed. So this is a little bit what, what can be done. And in addition, it's of course also about developing regulatory roadmaps. We see taxonomies coming up uh, in many places, raising awareness or developing new financial instruments uh, like sustainably linked bonds. Uh, contributing to the national policy and of course uh, this is where we stand for supporting international cooperation. As promised a few words uh, on our Young Academic Award and uh, every year we're doing award competition. Um, there's, there's only one requirement you can take part from all the countries uh, but you should be under 35. This, we have an age limit and we encourage uh, sending us uh, papers on the topics of financial in, uh, centers, working on our interested, as I said, uh, it's sustainability, it's fintech, it's supply chain, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, if, you're, if you're interested in, in taking part in that uh, award competition, maybe on, on one of the topics I've mentioned or anything else, we are also open to other topics. Uh, we will circulate a call for paper early February uh, and invite the winners. There's a little bit of prize money, uh, but maybe more important, we invite the winners to our annual general meeting. Uh, most likely next year will be New York City with travel expenses paid uh, and for giving presentation in, in front of our leaders. So this, is, this we do every year. We got papers from, from, from Hong Kong universities and we hope we will also see some next year. Um, unfortunately, no winner from uh, HKU this year, but yeah, we're working on it. Um, and yeah, here a picture of, of uh, our winners in, in Casablanca this year. Um, yeah, basically ESG and sustainable finance was really uh, an important topic. You see here uh, uh, a word cloud, financial inclusion also uh, very important. Uh, so some of the, the topics I, I took from the papers. Yeah, uh, the academic institutions. Yeah, this was a, the winning paper uh, from by Tristan. Uh, uh, he's a Belgium citizen on microfinance. Let me see whether I have others. Yeah, and then you see this was a second prize. We had two second prizes on uh, our top uh, lady from Mauritius, Hashini on ESG topics. Uh, Paul uh, from Munich, but he's also affiliated with the University of Southern California, um, with a quite interesting paper um, on uh, ESG. Uh, he looked at the uh, performances of listed companies uh, with ESG ratings over the last 12 years um, and uh, came to two uh, quite interesting conclusions after, after doing this uh, statistic research. One is investors appreciate uh, companies with a higher ESG core, uh, score. So, you know, they, they get more investments, higher, higher stock market prices compared to uh, companies uh, with a lower ESG core. This is the good news. Um, but uh, the second observation was the real performance, so profit, uh, profits of the companies, reported profits and so on, of the, of the companies with a higher ESG core were lower than the ones with a lower ESG core. So uh, yes, investors preferred, but yeah, the real performance uh, uh, is still an issue. We are in a transition period. Maybe this is uh, part of that transition period, but I hope in the, in the future this will look a little bit different. Yeah, the other thing, but I'll come to this, is the ESG core scores is also something, you know, we should not trust too much, but I'll come to this a little bit later. Yeah, let me skip this one. Yeah, a little bit the, the deadlines for next year, but now let's move into the future of finance, um, implicitly also the future of financial centers. Um, you see uh, from, the, from the center of this uh, chart to the outside, a little bit the, the time scale from 2020 to 2030. Um, of course, uh, you know, all this, uh, 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 the keywords you find here, uh, you can argue the positioning. It depends on where you are, uh, which financial center, and, and so on. 
Um, I've grouped, you know, all the developments uh, I think uh, are important in five categories. I don't need to say much about digital, trans digital transformation. We all know the impact on the financial industry, know the impact on the, on the other industries. Um, uh, I'll, I'll come to some of the topics, uh, but don't want to say uh, much more about this. I've separate, and you might argue about this, uh, big data and artificial intelligence. It's on one hand part of that digital transformation, but also has a slightly different quality. Um, then we see regional developments. Many people might argue, you know, the, this uh, decade is a decade of the Asian financial centers. Maybe the last decade also was a decade where the Asian financial centers sh uh, uh, showed strong development. Uh, but this decade for sure. Uh, I would argue the next decade, latest the next decade, will the decade of African financial centers. I mentioned already two cases. The financial industry usually goes where the growth is, because where the growth is, you can earn money. Right? So, and uh, I think the future growth will be uh, in certain uh, countries in Africa, not all. Um, as it's not a good idea to talk about Asia in general, it's also not a good uh, idea to talk about Africa in general, but some countries, sizable countries, I expect a lot of growth. Um, then uh, we face an economic change. Um, future of work, I've mentioned already, reskilling, which is uh, we need uh, now new profiles uh, for the financial industry, sharing economy, but also in, in many countries, aging societies. Uh, in my country, Germany is an issue, in Japan it's an issue, um, and this will also uh, have an, a strong impact on the financial centers and financial services. And then last but not least, of course, sustainability. Let's look at sustainability a little bit more in detail. First and foremost, uh, we started uh, uh, when the pandemic striked us in 2020 to, to think, uh, you know, what, what is the impact on the sustainability uh, agenda of the financial centers? And uh, we gave ourselves as a World Alliance or our members some recommendations. Uh, I don't want to go through all of them, uh, but just highlight here the, uh, uh, the second uh, pillar here, um, developing uh, sustainable finance expertise, capacity building. From my point of view, all of these uh, uh, topics here are important, uh, but this is something uh, where we have to act very quickly. I see wherever I go, there's really a lack of expertise. Of course, it's a little bit like we have seen in fintech and blockchain, you know, those topics become trendy and, and suddenly you have tons of experts. Everyone is 15 years blockchain, fintech, Bitcoin expert suddenly from one day to the other. Uh, but if you look a little bit behind that, um, I think there's a lack of expertise. In particular, if you think of that even small and medium-sized enterprises need that expertise, right? So we ask them to do reporting for their banks if they want to apply for a loan and then so on. Maybe not, uh, all small, not all the small countries need to hire a full-time person for, for the ESG reporting, but nevertheless, we don't have enough expert, enough expertise in, in, in most of our countries, and this is something you know, the financial industry in a way have to challenge the universities. Sorry for the universities, but it's like this. Uh, on the other hand, what the financial uh, industry can offer is high-paid uh, jobs in, in this sector, and this will last for a while. So I can only encourage you to have a look at this. Um, let's move to another topic, uh, sustainable investments. And uh, there's a good news and, and slightly bad news here. The good news is, if you look in the, long, in the long run here, starting from 2018, there's a strong increase worldwide in the, in the issuance of green bonds, also social sustainability uh, and sustainability links bonds. Uh, but if you look at the, at the right side, so the last quarters, it went down quite significantly, probably amid geopolitical headwinds. Of course, if you have other issues, maybe, uh, you know, the focus shifts a little bit of the, of the government, you know, we have wars and, and other geo geopolitical issues. Uh, in particular, 
uh, if we uh, look, uh, I don't have that slide, if we look a little bit who is behind, it's still uh, mainly Europe um, uh, with the green bond issuance. Mainland China is, is very active, but if you have a look at the aggregated numbers and then in the last quarters you could see, you know, the European part uh, shrinked, right? So this is, this is the issue. It's slowly coming back, uh, so from that point of view, um, maybe the next quarters will be better, but we have to yeah, raise awareness, uh, even geopolitical issues should not stop us from you know, following that, uh, that development because climate, fi uh, climate change will not, will not wait for us to sort out other issues. Um, a few words, uh, this might be interesting for, for some of you on, on, on Europe. Um, I don't want to say it's a role model for sustainable development, but just maybe a, a, a case uh, for, for you to consider. Um, the European Union uh, follows a sustainable finance strategy which uh, focus on, 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 on three core elements. One of them is the EU taxonomy. Taxonomy, EU taxon taxonomy here means uh, a definition, what is green and what is not. It's a little bit simplified, but uh, let's, let's uh, put it like this. So uh, it's a very detailed description, you know, uh, what are, you know, what are the, 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 the green parts in the, in the industry, in the industry production, uh, separately for environments, social and, and corporate governance. And uh, based on this, uh, the uh, European Union uh, have uh, uh, two major pieces of regulation uh, which are currently introduced. One of them is the Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation which requires asset managers or institutional investors to take ESG risk into account, which translate into looking the aggregated ESG scores of, of your portfolios and make sure you don't have uh, unreasonable risk in your portfolio because otherwise maybe uh, your investors might, might hit you, right? So, uh, or, or the regulators or both. On the other hand, uh, the Corporate uh, Sustainability Reporting Directive, which requires more and more corporates uh, to have annual ESG reporting uh, uh, in, in parallel to their financial reporting obligations, uh, it started with a listed company, it's now expanded to 50,000 businesses in, in, in Europe and, and, and growing. Um, and this is where, you know, more and more burden is, is, is put on, on those corporates uh, to have the, the expertise in place for this. And here the idea is not um, to rise, write some, some, some nice prosa about, you know, what, what you do, you know, like the sustainability reports before, here the focus is on numbers, right? So you should explain in a machine-readable form what you do. Uh, it's then like, the, like in accounting, the balance sheets, it's more like this and not, you know, the 100 pages, nice text and yeah, we, we help, we have charities in place and we have the local hospital and the local uh, sports club. It's not that topic anymore. Um, but there are two issues, uh, one of them, um, is that ESG data is noisy. This is at least what uh, three professors from MIT said in their, their famous publication, Aggregated Confusion, the Divergence of ESG Ratings. Um, they looked at uh, US listed corporates uh, and checked the ESG ratings from uh, a number of providers. You see here in the middle the names and they have found out they're all over the place. So um, I think the correlation was rather between 0.1 and 0.2% and not maybe 0.8 or 0.9% you are expecting. Um, and uh, the reason is, is quite easy. There, there is no harmonization in the measurement of the, of the, of the different factors. Even the select selection of the factors is up to the uh, rating agency. The rating is up to the uh, rating agency. And then if you aggregate this, of course, uh, the numbers coming out also, also differ a lot. So, which is an issue because not creating trust. Um, but the question, what is the way out? Having 
you know, financial regulators supervising them and requiring, you know, certain ways of, of calculation, or is it just a learning process and at the end they all will come up to similar numbers? I don't have an answer for this, but it's definitely an issue. And the other issue um, are, again, the small and medium-sized enterprises. You see here uh, four charts for Africa, Americas, APEC, and, and Europe, and the the red bars, these are small businesses with revenues uh, uh, lower than uh, roughly two, uh, two million US dollars. And you see the red corporates they are lacking behind, right? So it uh, means they have to catch up. The, the large corporates, they are prepared. They have the resources. For them, it's just another reporting. They have the, also the IT for, for this. But the small, maybe they already collect many of those numbers. But this, for the small business, is a challenge. And uh, for some of them, it's a perfect storm, right? So, you know, then you, we're talking about business maybe with a few hundred stuff, and then they have to do the digital transformation. They are facing geopolitical issues, supply chain, and now the financial industry also comes and asks for, for ESG reporting, right? So they're not too happy with this. Um, I've mentioned already the circular economy as an important factor. Uh, let me let me skip this that we have more time to talk about other uh, topics and also inclusive finance I think I've covered uh, already very well um, a few words uh, on the digital transformation after we have covered sustainability um, on one hand some of you might be familiar with the developments in fintech you know there's a huge increase in venture capital investment into fintechs. In my home country, Germany, last year, it skyrocketed from 1.8 billion uh, US dollars investment to 6 billion. Uh, UK even strong, more strong in Europe. Also here in Hong Kong, we have seen major rounds. Um, and in Asia in general, main, uh, uh, in the mainland, of course. On the other hand, at least in Europe this year looks a little bit weaker. The first half, first six months, we are still okay. Uh, I can tell you in Germany we had the three, three billion US dollars, so we were well on track. And then a lot of issues come in, and now the investors are much more selective. Um, if you're profitable or almost pro profitable, you're scaling up, it's okay. You might get your 100 million. Uh, but if you're, if you're just starting and you're looking for seed or Series A, it has become quite difficult. It's not impossible, but the investors are much more selective. So um, lucky if you, if you have a long runway and you don't need to raise money in the next 12 to 24 months, but some might fail because of, of, of this. Yeah, number of unicorns also have increased a lot, now coming back a little bit, at least the growth is coming back, the number is still increasing, of course. Um, artificial intelligence, uh, Douglas, you were part of this uh, uh, webinar series. Um, I think it might, might be that topic which have the biggest impact on the, on the financial industry, but this is my humble opinion, uh, where we'll see more and more automation. Um, it's starting on the financial intermediary side, um, but I'm very much convinced in a few years' time, whether it's a smartphone or classes or whatever, we will have AI, uh, which will take over most of the challenging uh, financial things we face in our day-to-day -day life. And let's have in mind, maybe you are uh, more closer to the financial industry by what you're doing, but I would say, 80 to 90% of the population, they don't like financial services at all. You know, it's like going to the dentist, or almost like going to the dentist. They are lacking the proper education. Um, they are easily falling for, you know, some salesperson selling them something they don't need, whether it's insurances or investments, uh, pension savings, and so on and so forth. And if you have a smart app powered by AI, which also has access to real-time data, which we cannot digest as, as human beings, and then, you know, take that decisions for, for you, decide, and then maybe once or twice a month coming up with a question or maybe just informing us, there's some spare money, we will put it in your pension scheme, you know, we have found the best products for you, uh, do you object, and then if you don't interact, then it will just follow. So, 
uh, I think this is what we will, will see in the coming years and will make our life easier. Um, open banking, uh, another uh, important aspect, you know, in some parts of the world it's driven by regulation. The European Union is, is, is part of it um, with PSD2, the Payment Service Directive, which requires bank to open up uh, by offering APIs to third-party providers like, like fintechs, um, and it uh, develops into a marketplace banking, which many of you might be familiar with. You just need to cross the border when it's possible again, and then look at the platforms of, of Tencent and End. You know, they already have you know, lots of services integrated, and uh, this is probably the future platforms and more and more non-financial platforms, you know, offering those services uh, in a very convenient way so that you don't have to, you know, log in and unsubscribe again and again and follow KYC, but you do one-time one KYC and then you can use all kinds of services. So, and here in Hong Kong, it's introduced step by step. Um, I, don't, I don't think the, the account data, I think the general account data is available if I remember correctly, but you still cannot uh, take the individual transaction out, right? So, uh, but it's also the monetary authority is, is working on it as far as I know. But in, in Europe, this is a major trend. And it also, other way around, leads to banks working with all kinds of fintech uh, companies. So. There's not a single bank in Germany who don't have five, six, seven fintech partners for all kinds of services. Metaverse, um, in finance, I've mentioned this already, we will see impact uh, you know, on, on training, on staff training. We might even see uh, bank branches in the metaverse because less and less people want to go to a physical branch. Maybe metaverse might be more interesting or not. I'm not sure uh, on this, but it's at least an option. Um, wealth management, uh, maybe in a 3D environment, it's easier to show you, you know, developments of your portfolio and, and so on. You can, you can look, you can maybe check uh, the companies you invested in, how they're doing. Uh, but also uh, digital twins, I think, will be more and more important. Maybe also here's a link to sustainability, um, so that we uh, also maybe then see the ESG scores, you know, uh, in a metaverse, we have more the look and feel of our portfolio, which companies, you know, are the bad guys in terms of ESG, are the browns, and I think we will have new ways of 3D visualization of financial services. And then, of course, central bank uh, digital currencies, so here are some of the expectation from, from Europe, peer-to-peer, real-time, programmable money. But I think the, 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 probably the governments uh, will have some restrictions, should be universal, secure, and should be possible to stream money. So pay continuously for parking or all kinds of other services, also machine to machine. So these are here a little bit of the ideas. Um, if you are in uh, central bank digital currencies, you might know um, there's the idea of a retail uh, CBDC, um, like, you know, the mainland China is implementing with a digital yuan, but there, of course there's also the idea of a wholesale CBDC, which could, you know, bring much more efficiency to processes, because then for the first time you can have atomic transactions. Think of security settlement, uh, you know, at exchanges, at the central security depositories, then you can exchange money versus uh, shares, which are also already held in a digital form in one single transaction and then avoiding counterparty risks. So a, a lot of opportunities also on that side. And then finally, decentralized finance. We will see more and more of those smart algorithms. Um, they're not contracts in a legal sense, but they're, they're smart algorithms which can automate you know, simple financial transaction you know, collateralized lending and so on. Currently, it only works in the, in the cryptocurrency environment where you give a certain cryptocurrency as a collateral and then you receive a loan in another cryptocurrency and then, you, you know, a few days later, you can reverse a transaction, you pay a small fee. Um, this works very well. Okay, not always. Most of the time works very well. There were, of course, some, some issues with this. Um, people try to exploit this, find the mistakes in those smart, smart contracts. 
Um, but I think it's, it's quite likely we will see more and more peer-to-peer -peer transaction. Um, so that you as a retail person, maybe can, you can deal with other, other persons, mobile phone to mobile phone without the need that you always have to have an intermediary. But no worries, uh, the banks will still exist because they're more complex transaction where you still need intermediaries. Um, but yeah, maybe the simple transaction will, will move uh, to more automation. And then my last slide, as promised, uh, Hong Kong Financial Center, here our member. Um, this is, uh, I want to bring up for, for discussion, a little bit of SWOT analysis on, on Hong Kong, my view. I have to admit, uh, has also, I'm now a few days in Hong Kong, has also changed a little bit here and there. Uh, but let's look at the, uh, you know, at the quite obvious things. It's a financial hub for the mainland for, for 30 years. Many mainland IPOs at Hong Kong exchanges, um, which is maybe the crown jewel of, of Hong Kong, the, you know, the mainland IPOs here, the stock and bond connect schemes, and now more schemes coming up. Um, there's a good, maybe even you can say an excellent balance between customer protection and openness for, uh, to innovation which is a very crucial thing. And then, uh, this is my favorite here, you have the right mixture between local Hong Kong, and this um, I, I'm talking about uh, the fellow of you who uh, were, were here in 1997, mainland uh, talent and international talent, right? So, and uh, you know, this mixture is, in, from my point of view, one of the important success factors. Um, they create enough trust, uh, international practice, it's not of course common law and, and many other, other things, but it's a quite convenient environment for all kinds of financial services. This makes Hong Kong strong. Um, it's also the trust in the rule of law and business ethics, uh, very important. Um, then of course, uh, the likes of Cyberport, Science Park, very early uh, the Hong Kong government had that idea to start, you know, those initiatives fostering startup culture here. Top universities, the Green Finance Association. Of course, the list should, can be much longer, but I just uh, wrote down which came into my mind, and you can, of course, argue with me. What are the, what are the weaknesses? Of course, the domestic market in Hong Kong is quite small. I think it's fair observation. It's not the mainland. There's no own industrial basis uh, here in Hong Kong. Mm, not many factories left, uh, uh, some source and, and so on. But uh, uh, geopolitics, mm, I think it's most of the time it's not against Hong Kong, but it's part of China. And yeah, so it's sometimes a little bit messy. Um, then uh, you hear quite good in tech adoption, but unfortunately it's a highly competitive space. You know, on the other side of, of, of Shenzhen uh, port, there's, there are players who are even faster in tech adoption than Hong Kong. So uh, while the Crater Bay area is definitely an opportunity, it also opens up competition with, with, uh, with Tencent and that kind of environment in Shenzhen and the Crater Bay area and all of the mainland. And uh, of course, uh, a little bit of loss of assets to Singapore and other safe harbors over, over the last years. Um, what are the opportunities? I've mentioned Crater Bay Area already. Um, so joining forces with the Crater Bay Area to become a, a powerful financial hub. So extending the cluster of Hong Kong Financial Center to include the Crater Bay Area. Um, then Hong Kong is the leading offshore renminbi hub and should become by nature also the, the hub for the internationalization of the digital yuan, right? So um, if you look at the central bank digital currencies, in a way, unfortunately, each central bank develops their own technical solution for, for their, some might be more blockchain DLT based, some might be, you know, um, based on accounts at the central bank, two-tier system like the PBOC and, and so on and so forth means at the end we will have the same uh, issue like we're facing be uh, for, for century, you know, you need to, you know, change money, right? So, and there need to be a hub where you can access in a very convenient way the digital yuan and maybe exchange it with other digital, uh, central bank digital currencies. What are the threats? 
not enough young talent in Hong Kong for the financial industry. I said this for in the case of ESG, but maybe it also might become an, a, a general problem, in particular if you expand to the Greater Bay Area. Um, you need to maintain this right mixture of uh, local mainland and international talent here. Um, if at the end, you know, it just consists of mainland talent, maybe this is not what international players uh, want to see. Um, and of course, uh, stronger competition from Shanghai and other mainland hubs. In the moment, it's not a problem. You know, Shanghai financial centers, of course, certain impact because of the lockdown and, and so on. The borders are not open yet. But if we look in the, on the long run, uh, of course, the mainland financial centers will, will catch up and become more international. And uh, I regularly meet in, in Europe, in, in Frankfurt, representative of, of Shanghai and Beijing, and saying we are the number one financial center in China, and we are already very international, and, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, let me stop here and uh, ask for your question, and I hope you disagree with some of the observations. Uh, then we have something to discuss. Thank you very much, Jacob. And maybe I'll just get everyone to join me in something that we haven't been able to do for a long time, which is actually applaud for a speaker. Uh, it's uh, one thing that you very much lose uh, in an online environment. Um, the other thing that I'd like to invite is basically those of you first in the audience, uh, open it for questions or, or comments. And then also for those of you uh, on the screen, if you do have uh, questions, feel free to, uh, to put those uh, in the chat. We don't have a huge amount of time, but I'll try to uh, take a couple uh, of questions to get things started. So one there, yes. And I'll take a couple to get things started. So I'll take Ross and then maybe one or two more if anyone else has one. Let me, let me uh, I think, immediate response is the, uh, the answer is, is no. Uh, of course, uh, we observe G20 and also B20, you know, the business uh, side behind G20, but we don't have any formal connection. Others, yes, please. Yeah. So this is more of a sort of question in a speculative nature, but it's, you know, carrying on from that mention that you had of, you know, virtual financial centers, decentralized finance, and metaverse. So in this general area, there's this new sort of proposed concept known as the network state being discussed, you know, which is basically a replacement for our current idea of nation states, but it's large, it's largely like, you know, you could say decentralized in a manner, not according to the actual principles of, of nation states, and not really going to delve into that thesis much. But um, if you're familiar with this idea, do you think that, you know, financial centers specifically are maybe the best opportunity to sort of develop something akin to network states, but, you know, replacing traditional financial centers, which are largely cities with these sort of, you know, largely decentralized online clusters uh, known as decentralized financial centers, which personally I think that might be, you know, the, the future of financial centers, but I wanted to know what your thoughts there would be. Uh, difficult, difficult question. I. I don't know. I see on the short term quite a number of challenges. Um, you know, we have, we have seen some developments which, which failed. Think about uh, the first decentralized autonomous organization, the DAO, and, and so on. And then, you know, international regulators like the SEC going after, uh, you know, them. I think there, there's a lot of legal risk and also tax risk and, and so on. Um, the financial centers still think in, in terms of physical clusters, and this is maybe two or three steps ahead. But uh, I will, I'm not ruling out we, we are developing in that direction. But my, my take is uh, in between we will see plain vanilla financial transaction moving peer to peer. It uh, doesn't mean moving out of our existing legal or nation state systems. They're still there, but uh, moving peer to peer. Um, and then maybe less, uh, let's say, 
uh, influenced by intermediaries, which uh, probably for, for some transaction, this is, it's not necessary to always have an intermediary in between. Not talking about uh, governments checking this is a, for anti-money laundering and so on. This is a different, uh, different uh, issue. Um, yeah, this is, this is my take, but what you, ha what you are asking for is, you know, quite, uh, yeah, few, few further steps, and I'm not sure whether we will see this mid to long term. Yes, please. Actually, we'll take both of those and then, yeah. All right. Oh, well, thank you, Dr. Biedemann, for such an interesting talk. Um, if one looks at the history of financial centers, generally, um, it's very hard for one to change the rankings barring some big events such as, you know, the growth of China yeah. or World War. Yeah. Um, my question is also more of a speculative nature, but it's what you think in terms of, you know, there's so much going on with finance right now in terms of innovations, uh, new occurrences. And I was wondering what you think um, has the greatest potential to be a disruptor in the current financial center rankings. Yeah, I, I mentioned this already. Uh, my, my take is artificial intelligence will, will have the, the strongest impact. Um, uh, I hope the sustainable finance issue, which keeps us very busy at the moment, will be more or less sorted out in a few years' time. Not the climate uh, change. I think this probably will give us more trouble, but you know, organizing you know, the financing of, of the transition, having the right instruments in place, and then at some point in time might be business as usual for, for, for banks or other investors to, to finance that transition, right? So then we have the tools in place. Uh, but artificial intelligence, and if you, if you think further, um, it's not clear yet what we will, you know, what is the final state of it. It's, it has a potential to develop further and further, um, you know, because the, the capacity, uh, the computer cap capacity is further increasing. We will, we will see quantum computing coming up and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we, we have seen already uh, most of the financial industry moving real time. Uh, we see it now on the, on the, on the retail side. You know, we in our day-to-day uh, -day financial transaction are expecting also more and more real-time interaction. We want to transfer money and the money should arrive immediately and not the next day or not in five minutes. So everything going faster, more data needs to be processed in a shorter period of time. Um, more data is collected and then AI uh, and, uh, you know, the, the technologies, you know, look at NVIDIA and, the, you know, what they're investing and, and such players. So uh, I expect uh, uh, a much further change in, in that sector, and it's currently very difficult to foresee where this will end. Hi, thank you for such a great presentation. My question is related to the opportunities box on the SWOT yeah. analysis. So I noticed that both of the opportunities you listed there are related to mainland China. So my question is, um, do you think Hong Kong uh, is only good for uh, you know uh, banking its future tying itself with mainland China, or should we uh, consider device, uh, diversifying ourselves because I unfortunately am old enough to remember, uh, a t uh, uh, you know, there was a time before uh, where Hong Kong has had a much bigger business and financial cluster yeah. that serves uh, uh, nothing related to Chinese interests. Uh, it's just people from all over the world and all over Asia. And obviously we've seen that uh, uh, significantly downsized in the last couple of years. Um, uh, but I'm just wondering from a long-term perspective if this is the right way because from basic, you know, uh, investment uh, uh, thesis, right? We shouldn't put all of our eggs in one basket. Uh, to give you a one recent example, I think the uh, CSRC announced uh, expanding yep. the Stock Connect program to include non, uh, like international companies listed on HKEX, mm. uh, but actually we wound up finding ourselves not having that many non-Chinese, non-Hong Kong companies on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange to be included mm. in that program. Mm. And the HKEX now is like on the marketing a mission to try to attract uh, uh, companies to list there, right? non-Chinese mm. companies. So I'm sorry, this is a quite a long question, but also a bit of a comment. I'm very interested to hear what you think when you and what do you members think about when they when you are you know look at Hong Kong 
Mm. Do, do you really think Hong Kong is only good for being this gateway to China, or there's more to Hong Kong's potential? Because after all, our city's logo, a uh, slogan is Asia's war city, not China's war city. Thank you. Yeah. Um, thanks for that question. Uh, of course, it's more. Um, the first thing, you know, of course, internationally, uh, which international investors think about is, uh, you know, Hong Kong as a, as, a, as a portal, as a bridge to the mainland China. Uh, but uh, Hong Kong, similar to London and, and New York, also attract a lot of global business and uh, play an important role um, for international business, treasuries, and, and so on and so forth. And definitely Hong Kong needs to uh, do more to develop this further. In the in the Greater Bay Area, um, I think it's uh, it's it's interesting to to see how the, how it will uh, will be sorted out. Uh, on one hand, uh, of course, you have a you will you will you will have a competition between the you know large regions in 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 in, in Greater China, so Beijing, Tianjin, then Ho uh, Shanghai, Jiangsu, and. Uh, uh, area including Hangzhou and, and what's happening there and then the the greater Bay area so this is a competition within in China for the domestic business and maybe later also for international IPOs and and so on um, so Hong Kong as part of the greater Bay area will face competition here but also in the greater Bay area uh, of course it's not only cooperation it will also be competition and the question for me is um, having the tech cap uh, capabilities outside of Hong Kong in the Greater Bay Area and Shenzhen, uh, uh, Guangdong province, Guangzhou and so in mind, and having you know, the strong international financial center in Hong Kong in mind, um, who will benefit more? Will Hong Kong benefit more from adding the, the tech from the Greater Bay Area or will the Greater Bay Area, the other places, let's say Shanghai, Shenzhen, benefit more from Hong Kong, you know, serving the international client, and then who will become stronger because of this? So it's a, it's a, it's a two-way process if you, if you look in the greater barrier. And then, of course, the last thing for you, for, for, for the international players and so on, is how, you know, transparent the greater barrier will be, um, how, what is the ease of doing business, um, how easy it is to cross the border, right? So uh, depends a little bit. And then also, uh, this maybe you can answer better than me. I heard, okay, it's some, the Hong Kong student don't like to work in the Greater Barrier and, and so on and so forth. So how you can interact. Of course, in a best, in a, in a best world, this should be a seamless process where the border crossing should be at, as easy as a Schengen zone in, in the European Union. Um, and you, from everywhere, you can you can do business easily, and it doesn't matter whether you have a you're graduated from a Hong Kong university or from a mainland university in the in the Greater Bay Area. Um, Hong Kong University, as far as I know, also already very active in the in the Greater Bay Area. So, yeah, but it should be a seamless process uh, working and then doing financial service in the Greater Bay Area, and of course there's. A little bit to go, not only because the borders are closed, but also in general. And the uh, bridge to Macau and high-speed train connection are very important steps, but I think there's much more to do. Thanks very much for that, Jochen, and I think that's uh, an excellent note to, to wrap, on, wrap up on. My personal view is very much it needs to be both, uh, even if from the standpoint of serving uh, the increasing numbers of international headquarters of mainland companies that are based in Hong Kong, those firms need the connections out. Uh, and I think that that's very much uh, what we need to be focusing on uh, going forward. Um, with that, I very much want to thank uh, Jochen for joining us. It's been a fantastic presentation. It's been some great questions. It's been fantastic to have uh, a live audience uh, and look forward to doing this more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.